I think we'll be on Mars by 2030. Uh, and uh, I have um, much more confidence in this than in uh, the previous um, predictions, because those were based on, on the one hand, technical reality that we could do it, but it also depended upon political decisions being made, uh, which were not made. And uh, But now what we have is we have a private space program. We've got SpaceX, which is uh, developing the means to get to Mars. And they are committed. They're all in. Elon Musk is all in. And he's not building a ship in Boca Chica. He's building a shipyard. He's turning these things out. And his philosophy is build them, fly them, wreck them, remake them, fly them again until you make it work. And, you know, Musk, of course, uh, makes optimistic predictions. He said he'd reach orbit this year with Starship. I don't think he will. But I think it's certain that he'll reach uh, orbit and be reaching orbit routinely with Starships by 2024. And um, if that's the case, uh, you know, we're going to have a new president in 2024. And uh, if Starships, which are fully reusable, heavy lift launch vehicles, you know, capability equal to the Saturn V, but one tenth the cost, if those are routinely flying to orbit by 2024, that's a different reality. And the new president's going to turn to his or her advisors and say, look at this. Could we have people on Mars by the end of my second term? And the answer is going to be certainly yes. Will it cost hundreds of billions of dollars? No. Will it cost tens of billions of dollars? Well, maybe 10. Well, then let's do this. And at that point, we'll have the government space program, NASA, meet Musk halfway. Because there's some stuff he need, he he's developing the biggest stuff, the transportation system. But there's other stuff that's needed, and some of it would be hard for him to develop. For instance, nuclear power reactors for use on the Martian surface, because they involve the use of highly enriched uranium, which is tightly controlled. NASA can develop that part, and certain other surface systems. Uh, and uh, by making it feasible, he's going to make it sellable. It will sell. It will fly. So you think it will be a collaboration between NASA and SpaceX or maybe other private companies? Well, certainly other companies uh, will join in once the thing is, is underway. But the two primary partners will be NASA and SpaceX and then uh, other space agencies and other private companies around the world can uh, take a role as well. Uh, do you think it will be an international effort? Uh, will the Russians and the Chinese join in, maybe the Europeans, or will the Americans be solely responsible for that? It will certainly turn out to be an international effort on behalf of the, the Western countries. And uh, it's, it's conceivable that Russia would join in. That's up to Russia. Uh, now, China is, is a little different, uh, but I think it could be fully international, um, especially if we adopt a... Um, bring your own ship attitude. We're going, why don't you come to? And perhaps we can have uh, a bit of an Olympic style competition uh, for who can win the most honors or the most glory, if you will, for making the most discoveries. We'll be there to help each other. It's something you may not know. I was actually in Leningrad when we landed on the moon. Um, oh. because, yes, I was. And because uh, as, as, as a kid, I, I, I was a chess player. Uh, competitive chess player. And so I was in Leningrad and all the Russians I knew, you know, come up to Maletietz. I mean, it was like that a boy. They, they, we had excelled in a sport that they appreciated. You might put it that way. And uh, now the leaders might have been having kittens, but the, the people liked it. And uh, certainly it, it, if, if the Russians of that day could have taken a part in that mission, they would have loved to. And there was a certain camaraderie between the astronauts and the cosmonauts, even though this was the height of the Cold War. And I think this sort of cooperative competition that we had during the space race did more to accelerate uh, progress in space than the direct co cooperation we've had on the space station, uh, because it forced each uh, player to do their best in a way that a direct collaboration does not. <laughs> certainly plenty of people in Russia would want to be part of this. And, you know, by creating a private space company, Musk is showing the way for any country, including countries that are not considered spacefaring countries, like, you know, New Zealand now has reached orbit through Rocket Lab, even though New Zealand doesn't even have a government space program. Yeah, well, state inefficiency is a problem. I mean, look, the Apollo program was successful because even though it was a government program, it had a very clear purpose. Government programs can be effective when they have a very clear 
purpose and are purpose driven and they can do incredible things. And we've seen this in, in certain military programs as well, without question. But when they don't have a clear purpose, then it just becomes a program where the government's giving away money and it becomes about uh, it becomes a vendor driven program instead of a purpose driven program. And so it becomes extremely inefficient. Uh, instead of spending money to do things, they do things to spend money. We saw this with the American space program. We saw this with the Soviet space program. Musk is certainly purpose-driven. He's not doing things to spend money because he's spending his own money. He's spending money to do things. Return to the days of a purpose-driven program. And it doesn't have to be driven by um, harsh international competition. It, it can be driven by both the, the desire for discovery and, yes, the desire for eternal glory for doing great deeds. Yeah. And uh, the, by being the first to make great discoveries. And that's healthy. Why do you think the U.S. Uh, space program uh, has not been purpose driven? I've seen your passionate speech in the uh, Senate, I think, a dozen years ago. And after that, the, some decisions were taken that uh, the Americans should go to the moon and then to Mars. But no results were reached. Well, it did not have the commitment. You know, Bush said, I want to return to the moon. He's saying this in 2004. He says, we'll do it in 2019, which is basically saying, I think we should return to the moon and I hope whoever follows me as president does it. Whereas John F. Kennedy said, I want to be to the moon before this decade was out. And he was looking at being president through 1968. So he was basically saying, I'm looking at that at me doing this. We're going to do this. And he was up front. This is going to cost a lot of money and you got to be committed to this. He didn't try to sugarcoat it. Oh, it won't cost that much. No, he was all in. And we were mission driven and we did it. Goal for the human spaceflight program, it has become vendor driven. Now, the science program, to a large extent, has remained mission driven. That is, you know, they don't send rovers to Mars to give money to airbag companies. They send rovers to Mars to send rovers to Mars. And if they need airbags, they buy airbags. You know, th that's how that is. And, and the space telescopes and so forth. And yes, I mean, in any kind of government pro contracting, there's always some entropy and some waste. But still, the overall thrust has been mission driven. And so, for example, the Test Space Telescope, which was launched a year ago, uh, for it's a planet finder, um, It was launched on a Falcon 9. And now, they could have launched it on a Delta IV Heavy for four times the money. But since the science directorate wanted to save money, in other words, they weren't in business to give business to uh, Boeing for its overpriced Delta IV. They said, what's the cheapest rocket we have that will do the job? Well, it's a Falcon 9. Okay, we'll use that. Whereas, for instance, if you look at the Artemis program that NASA is currently doing, they're saying, we're going to the moon, but it must use SLS. And it must use Orion, even though Orion is so heavy that even the SLS can't deliver it to low lunar orbit with enough fuel for it to come home. So they have to now build a whole new space station in high lunar orbit, they call the gateway. Um, and that also, therefore, means that the lunar landing and ascent vehicle has to go much further. And it needs to be twice as big as it otherwise would have to be if they went to low lunar orbit. But if they used a Falcon Heavy and a Dragon, because the Dragon, Dragon weighs nine tons, Orion weighs 26. Falcon Heavy is strong enough to deliver a Dragon to low lunar orbit with enough propellant for it to come home. So you got a launch vehicle that costs one tenth as much. You got a capsule that costs one tenth as much, and it gets you to a better orbit. Why not do that? Well, Because there's a senator from Alabama says SLS is being made in my state and you're going to use SLS. Okay. Okay. Because as far as I'm concerned, that's what this program is all about.